Hi guys, let's take a look here at chapter 35. So if we catch up, um, the McNabb brother ended chapter four asking, what are you doing with my little brothers? So remember um, how it ended in chapter 34 that McNabb's not a very nice guy and he's kind of wondering, what is Maniac doing with my two little brothers? Chapter 35, this is probably the longest chapter in the book. It took a while for everything to get straightened out. First, Giant John had to be convinced that Maniac was not kidnapping his brothers. Then the, then the brothers had to do something more trembling and clinging while John finished lambasting them for running away, which apparently they did about every other week. Then when the brothers found out that their pizza person was none other than the fami famous Maniac McGee, the very same one, who had blasted their big brother's fastballs to smithereens and finished them off with a home run frog, well, took a good five minutes of rolling on the sidewalk to get all the laughing out of their systems. Which, of course, got jo Giant John more than a little steamed. Prompting Maniac, who didn't like seeing John disgrace before his little brothers, to say, Yeah, but didn't John tell you what happened the next day? And the brothers said, No, what? And Giant John said, Huh? And Maniac winked at John and crossed his fingers. Sure, John, you remember, wink, wink, at the Little League field that the next day. You said I was lucky that all you threw me was fastballs because you weren't ready to reveal your secret pitch, the one you'd been working on. Remember? Wink. McNabb nodded dumbly. And so I said, well, come on, I can hit anything. Pitch it to me, and you pitch it, and I missed it by a mile, and you kept pitching it to me all day long, and I never even hit a foul ball on it. What was the pitch? What was the pitch, Chain of the Urchins? It was, man, it paused for dramatic buildup. The stop ball. The stop ball? Yeah. And you should have seen it. It comes right up to the plate, looking all fat and easy to belt. And then just when you take your swing, man, it got into his batter stance and demonstrated. It sort of stops, and your bat just whiffs the air. He whiffed at an imaginary stop ball. Wow, said the brothers, gazing up at their big brother. And so Maniac was invited to accompany the brothers McNabb to their home. Despite the cold, the front door was wide open and Maniac could smell the inside before he could see it. The first thing he did see was a yellow, short-haired mongrel looking innocently up at him while taking a leak in the middle of their living room floor. Clean that up, John ordered Russell. Clean that up, Russell ordered Piper. Piper just walked on by. After closing the front door, which was surprisingly heavy, Maniac found a stack of newspapers in a corner. He laid some over the puddle to soak in, then gave himself a tour of the downstairs. Maniac had seen some amazing things in his lifetime, and nothing as amazing as that house. From the smell of it, he knew this wasn't the first time an animal had relieved itself on the rugless floor. In fact, in another corner, he spotted a form of relief that could not be soaked up from the newspapers. Cans and bottles lay all over, along with crust, peelings, coarse scraps, rinds, wrappers, everything you would normally find in a garbage can. And everywhere there were raisins. As he walked through the dining room, something, an old tennis ball, hit him up on the top of the head and bounced away. He looked up into the laughing faces of Russell and Piper. The hole in the ceiling was so big, they both could have jumped through it at once. He ran a hand along one wall. The peeling paint came off like cornflakes. Nothing could be worse than the living and dining rooms that the kitchen was. A jar of peanut butter had crashed to the floor. Someone had gotten a running start, jumped into it, and skied a brown one-footed track to the stove. On the table were what appeared to be the remains of an autopsy performed upon a large bird, possibly a crow. The refrigerator contained two food groups, mustard and beer. The raisins here were even more abundant. He spotted several of them moving. They weren't raisins. They were roaches. The front door opened and seconds later, a man clomped into the kitchen. He wore no winter jacket, only a sleeveless green sweatshirt, which ballooned him over his enormous stomach. Tattoos blued his upper arms. His hands were nearly pure, nearly pure black. Still body odor mingled with that of fries and burgers coming from the Burger King bag he held. Dropping the bag next to the bird remains, he bellowed, Chow! and took a beer from the fridge. He downed a good half of it in one swig, belched, doubled, clutched, and belched again. He had to know someone besides himself was standing in the kitchen, and just as obviously, he didn't care. 
Two floor quaking crashes came from the dining room. Geronimo! Geronimo! Russell and Piper had taken the direct route via the hole. What'd you bring, Dad? Whoppers? Yeah, whoppers! They tore into the bag like jackals into carrion. Plastic flew, fries flew. They both wanted the same whopper. Mashed between their tugging fists, the whopper splurted sauce and cheese and pickle chips, then it split. Russell lurched backward into the kitchen table with its half. Piper lurched backward in the opposite direction with nothing to stop him, sailed right through the cellar doorway and down the cellar steps. The final thud was followed by the truck horn blast of Piper's laughter. When Giant John ambled in, the father said, Get the blocks. No, grunted John, pulling out a pair of whoppers. He tossed one a maniac. We need more, growled the father. John didn't answer. We need more. I heard. McNabb smashed the tabletop. Three fries and a bird wing jumped to the floor. Now, John walked out, nonchalantly munching. I was busy. The rest of the night was scenes from a loony movie. Scene. McNam the father, Swagger's bear, armed out the front door, bellowing back. Do your homework. Scene. Manic retrieves the wet newspaper from the living room. There were no waste baskets in the house. He finds a trash can in the backyard next to a pile of cinder blocks. He dumps his soggy papers in the can, which is empty. Scene. Small turds of an unfamiliar shape appear here and there along the baseboards of the first floor. Please don't be rats, Maniac prays. Scene. The Cobras come in. They glare at Maniac, but Giant John tells him to lay off. They raid the fridge for beer. They smoke cigarettes. They belch and fart. They curse. Russell and Piper, Kitty Cobras, pop their own beer cans, guzzle, swagger, belch, smoke, and curse. Scene. Football game from the front of the living room to the back of the dining room. Except for space, it is everything a regular game has. Running, passing, blocking, tackling, kicking. There is little furniture to get in the way. Ordinarily, the windows wouldn't last five minutes, but the windows of this house are boarded up with plywood. Body black cobras fly into the walls. The house flinches. Scene. A faint rustling noise behind the stove. Oh, no rats. Maniac dares to look. It's a turtle, box turtle, turtle munching on old whopper lettuce. Phew. Scene. The boys' bedroom. Russell and Piper lay prone at the hole. The, time, the fire toy, submachine gun, ta-ta-ta-ta, at the cobras heading out the front door. Piper jumps up and blows Maniac away, killing him at least 15 times. This is how we're going to do it. Bam, bam, bam. The guns will be real, says Russell, still prone and firing the stock of the toy gun against his cheek. Yeah, squawks Piper, real. He flops back to the floor, sprays the hole downstairs. Soon as they start coming in, bam, bam, bam. Who, says Maniac? The enemy, says Russell. Who's that, says Maniac? What Russell stops firing long enough to send Maniac out. Where have you been? Look, who do you think? He sneers. He points the red barrel of the submachine gun to the bedroom floor. Toward the east, the east end. The heavy front door. Scene. Darkness, silence. Sometime early morning, Maniac lies between the two brothers on the bed. Do cockroaches climb up bedpost? Unable to sleep, asking himself, what am I doing here? Remembering Hester and Lester on his lap. Grayson's hug. Corn muffin in the toaster oven, thinking, who's the orphan here anyway? Hearing as he at last lowers himself in his sleep's deep waters, a door slam, a slurred voice, do your homework, fearing, will I float? So Maniac really thinks in this chapter, is it so bad being an orphan or even though the McNabb Boys are not orphans, technically, because they have a place to live. Who has it better off? So kind of think about that as this chapter ends. Yes, Manic's an orphan moving around. He doesn't have a stable family um, place to go. But this house is just hopefully, as you're reading it, you're thinking, whoa, I feel bad for these poor kids. Not a clean environment live day by day on their food and how they talk and respect each other. His dad just yells, do your homework and kind of leaves and doesn't really sit down and talk with them. So Maniac's thinking, gosh, I miss the Beals. I miss Grayson. And he says that question, who's the orphan here? It's not Maniac. That's not what he's thinking.